So that uh, brings us to the uh, official part of uh, the evening, and uh, probably recording will uh, commence uh, shortly, if it uh, hasn't started already yet. So if you don't want to be recorded on the stream, you uh, probably want to uh, switch off your uh, cameras. Uh, of um, also during the uh, presentation, uh, please um, have your questions for uh, after the presentation, and you can um, do the questions after the presentation either by a microphone. Um, there's probably some uh, etiquette. I think this always works out quite all right. Or put it in the uh, public uh, chat, and then we'll relay the question to the presenter. And uh, our presenter for tonight is uh, Nico Sotelius from Switzerland. Um, I have uh, run into Nico more or less during RIPE meetings. Uh, I've seen some of his uh, presentations and we had some interaction on uh, Twitter on the uh, subject of uh, IPv6, uh, so to say. Uh, Nico uh, runs a data center where he doesn't allow in a legacy IP, so he only works with uh, the new uh, stuff. And um, yeah, uh, without uh, further ado, uh, Nico, uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Um, first of all, I have to say thanks for having me here. And uh, in the pre-session here, I just tried to figure out whether it's true, but it's I think it's really true. Like. The FTP server here of uh, NLUUG was probably one of the first systems in the internet I used, actually. So quite a bit of, not childhood memory, but uh, early memories there. So quite funny. But let's come uh, to the topic of today. And uh, it's about uh, high-speed NUT 6.4 with P4. Um, I will go a bit into details of P4 and co. I think probably most of you know why one want to have high-speed NAT64. But for those who are um, not believing the new religion of IPv6 yet, uh, I do have some graphs and uh, they have footnotes, so they are trustworthy, uh, according to XKCD. It's very important. Now that said, um, I think we, we all know here, and it's pretty clear that there's not a lot of IPv4 in general, and especially there's not a lot of IPv4 left that you can actually get. Um, you, some of you probably also already know the graphs. On the left is the uh, famous one from uh, potaro.net, which basically shows the rundown of the five RIRs, even though there are only four in the legend. and Basically, what it shows is like uh, everywhere in the world, we're running out of IPv4. Again, not so much of a surprise. Uh, what is interesting, like since I've been started talking about this topic, I think we started at something like about uh, 0 0.4 slash 8, and now it's down to 0 0.36 slash 8, which is all from the beginning already quite little IPv4. Um, given that uh, we are somewhere around uh, almost 10 billion people in the, in the world soon, there, there's a bit of a mismatch. So that said, the general, there's a general motivation uh, using IPv6. Um, I, I will not come to the uh, you know, vast majority of IP spaces. I think probably clear for everybody. What is more interesting to see that uh, some countries nowadays are crossing or have crossed the 50% um, IPv6 utilization or usage uh, uh, in their countries, most notably India uh, and uh, the US and Belgium, like the ones that we always see. And overall worldwide, if you average it at the Google traffic, you see around 35% of IPv6 traffic nowadays. So it's not like in the early 2000s where we had this nice uh, IPv6 protocol and in theory it works. Nowadays it's in practice, it works. And in practice, uh, we are in the ripe region, we don't really have IPv4 addresses that you can get. Sure, there's the uh, free market out there. You can spend some money on uh, buying some uh, used IPv6 addresses, whatever that means. Uh, it doesn't really wear off. Uh, might have a bad reputation, might have been used for something, whatever. Um, point being, um, 
from my point of view, it, it's a little late if you just start thinking about IPv6. Now you have to act, but you also have to bridge between IPv4 and IPv6. And one of the um, possibilities there is to use NAT64, which brings me to like the key technologies that I used uh, for this project. And um, just to come back like to the very, very basics, uh, I guess like every, everybody has seen uh, like some RFCs. Um, so this is not new format here, but it's always quite interesting to go back to uh, the packets and actually have a look that V4 and V6 are actually not that different. I mean, yes, bigger sizes, great. Um, but in the end, um, what we have is, is IPv6 is quite a simple packet uh, format. V4 is a bit more historically grown, but the most important parts are actually that both of them have stores and destination addresses, clearly. Both of them have an indicator what is inside the packet and the rest, yeah, plus minus, uh, you know, uh, you can use it, but you know, some parts are not, or many parts are actually not that often used, besides the TTL, obviously. Um, what is interesting, and um, when, when I started looking at this, is when you start manipulating packets, is actually that translating V6 to V4 is not just taking some part out and taking another part in, it's actually that you need to mangle with the upper or lower layer protocols as well. So when you actually are a switch and uh, you see an ethernet frame, the ethernet frame actually indicates what kind of packet you are actually dealing with. Is it a v4 packet or is it an ipv6 packet? So when you do translations, you actually have to uh, modify the ethernet frame as well. In general, uh, today I will talk more about uh, NAT64 uh, because it's very universal and it's uh, yeah, very much protocol agnostic, which are, will be the whole topic basically today. Um, but there's also proxying. And um, I'm mentioning this because in some situations, NAT64 might not be the best situ uh, solution for you, but uh, protocol dependent, like uh, be it like TCP based or uh, UDP or HTTP or HTTP2 or I'm not saying FTP, uh, we had this before. We don't want to do stuff with FTP if we can avoid it. Um, but it might actually make more sense to actually proxy in, in some situations. Uh, for instance, web servers, um, I can see here in the chat, many of you are older than 15 or older than 18 or much older. Um, so you, you have been there when you had a web server and basically in HTTP, there was no indication of the server name. So basically you had one web server and you had one IP address and you had another web server and another IP address. And obviously, again, this doesn't really scale. Um, so we have the uh, server name, the host name in, in the HTTP and HTTP, HTTPS headers. Um, and th this helps a lot to multiplex one server or one IP address with a lot of different domain names. And the same applies for proxying when you're going from the V4 and V6 world. As a matter of fact, um, everything we do here at Ungleich, um, most services we run are IPv6 only. And a lot of them, which are not NAT64 translated, are actually translated on HTTP or HTTPS basis. So what I'm saying is NAT64 is a very universal thing and can be used for a lot of things, but sometimes you might actually opt for proxying instead. Um, so NAT64, um, it's, it's, it's a bit funny actually, uh, because we, it says NAT64 as if we are going from IPv6 to IPv4, but it's actually both directions. So um, it could also be NAT646 or 46. Um, and, and they're actually quite an interesting uh, alternatives like uh, XLAT464 and other things. I'm not going to talk about this today. 
In, in general, when you when you do NAT64, uh, you're actually doing three steps. First one is you adjust uh, the Ethernet protocol. This one we had before, just uh, adjusting uh, the protocol uh, number basically in in the frame. Uh, then you need to modify all the or exchange the IPv4 to IPv6 headers and vice versa. But now comes the, comes the interesting quirk, and that is we have checksums in TCP, in UDP, in ICMP, and ICMP6. And those checksums include the, depending on your point of view, upper or lower level uh, protocols. So when you modify uh, the IPv4 and IPv6 header, you actually invalidate the checksum of TCP and UDP and ICMP and ICMP6, which is quite unfortunate, uh, as we'll see a little later. Um, today, I'm going to talk about P4 in regards to NUT64. And uh, now I wanted to, to do a poll. Uh -huh. I try it again. Uh, let me see if I can do it a little bit better. The poll means A, I have used or no P4, or B, I have no clue what P4 is. Let's see if I do it right, this one. So B, I have no clue what P4 is. A, I have used it or I know it. It works quite well. Huh. Thanks for the education uh, teaching before. Right, so we're more than 50% have no clue what P4 is. That's good. I don't have it either. Uh, I'm just talking from somewhere now. Um, okay, that's good to know. So then you, uh, I will be able to talk to uh, you about something very interesting today. The first time I met P4, it was with a lot of skepsis because it's promising a lot of things that seem to be impossible. Um, P4, um, generally speaking, is a, it's a programming language and it looks pretty similar to C in terms of coding. And um, actually, let me have a look. Yeah, we go into this one first. So P4 is really a protocol independent programming language. So the promise is you use any switch or any networking gear, you um, compile it and you can handle any protocol. It's a bit like the any key thing, like you can select anything, but how, how does this really work? So this is the first claim, and this is like already pretty strong that you say like there are packets and you can do things with it and it's protocol independent. That's, that's really, really cool. The se second thing P4 promises, and uh, we had it about Java before, and yes, we are back there. Uh, P4 promises to be target independent. So you write the code once and it runs everywhere. Let me make a quote here for later. And even better, it runs at line speed. And this is something that is quite amazing. So you have your code and you have some constraints to the code, as we have to say, but you have your code and you, you do protocol independent modifications inside your network gear and you run at line speed. So we're, we're talking one gig, 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig, terabit. It's all supposed to work. Hmm. This is quite, quite interesting. So, so how, 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 how it works in general. So first you write or you have a parser block and the parser block basically says, um, well, we said we are protocol independent. So we need to somehow actually have something that we can operate with. So what we say is like, all right, I have an something coming in that's on a cable, supposedly, or we are even dealing with wireless, even though I don't I haven't seen any wireless things yet. I think it's also not the uh, use case of P4. But hypothetically, you get something in via something into your uh, gear, usually cable. And that can be an Ethernet frame. So what you do is you write a parser and you say like the first bits that come in, I say like, okay, the first parts are actually Ethernet frame. So I can kind of like look at the packet like a bit like a stack. So 
So I can take away, okay, the first bits are uh, this header, they can throw away some bits and I can parse the next part and I can pass the next part and can pass the next part. And there you can already hear a bit of a limitation of P4 because P4, generally speaking, um, expects you to have fixed length fields because you pop away something and you say these bits are that, these bits are TCP, these bits are uh, IP, uh, these bits are IPv4, or these bits are Ethernet frame, or DECnet, or whatever. And the nice thing is, again, P4 doesn't limit you and doesn't say what you should be doing. It just operates on bits, and you define your own thing. And actually, this this goes quite well. This this is not so much effort, to be honest. So then, what happens is you have parsed the packet, and with this, you have given the packet some kind of metadata structure. Uh, now we can operate on saying, okay, I have um, Ethernet parts, I have IPv4 parts, and you can do some small conditionals already in there and saying like, all right, if the Ethernet frame contains uh, this value at this position, then like we said before, it's going to be an IPv4, or IPv6 packet. So we can do a little bit of branching already in the parser. The impressive part is then happening in the ingress and the egress parts. And those are interesting. Um, I will talk a little bit about this in detail. You, you do have those so-called match action pipelines. And how you can imagine this is um, P4 operates basically on tables. And you do have, um, let's say, uh, you say, I do have, mm, you can comp maybe compare it a bit of like, to a switch statement where we say we have a number of value, uh, 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 a certain uh, list of values. We say like, if this is a value of that specific field, then do some code. And this some code um, has limited loops. Um, it doesn't really have real loops because then you cannot guarantee line speed anymore. Um, you have, a little bit of a fake stack, which is not a real stack. So it's basically the code is later shifted by the compiler. And you have these building blocks, this match action pipeline. Now, the interesting part is, uh, so basically this is a table lookup. So you say these bits are that, then do action this. So in the concrete part of uh, example of NAT64, you say this is an IPv4 packet with the destination address uh, within some range. So you can ma uh, match on uh, network masks. This is built in into P4. Uh, you can match on some ranges uh, and say, okay, it's an IPv4 packet that we want to translate. So we go into the translator uh, function, which is not a real function. And depending on where you are, it's actually more, you can see more like a macro. Now we have the same thing on the egress side where we can again say like, okay, now we say we want to exit on some kind of port. And here again, we want to do some actions based on uh, previous, on, on the on current state of the packet. The interesting part is that these two chips parts here are usually the same. So depending on the layout of the actual gear that you have, you actually share the tables and depends on like how many things you have, you can even run at half speed to run more actions because they're actually the same ships that you are using. So you can go bigger and, and reduce your speed. In the end, um, so within this part, the ingress and egress part, we are operating on known bits or like uh, metadata or packets that we classified. And here it might have been an IPv4 packet then we go to egress and we send out an IPv6 packet. But then we also need to deparse it. We need to say, all right, uh, now we have actually an IPv6 packet. So we need to reassemble the different parts that we have in the correct order. So we, we certainly want to have the IPv6 header after the Ethernet frame and not vice versa. But because P4 is so universal, it doesn't know the byte on its own. So you need to say, all right, I'm emitting now this part and that part and that part. So it's really 
really like you can really think about a stack there. So far, generally speaking, how P4 operates. Now, I go one slide back and let's have a look at this uh, P4 targets. And the target is something where P4 is running on. In the easiest case, and, and I have to emphasize it's really the easiest case, using BMV2, which is the behavior model. And it's a software emulation of P4. You can run it on any machine. Um, it's really fast for prototyping. And now comes the interesting part. Um, it has support in their functions uh, to build checksums over the payload. Now I have to go three steps back. Initially I said, P4 is very good with fixed length things. It doesn't really, it, it has some notion of variable length parsing, but it's not so easy. And it also makes sense because variable length is a hard thing to do in, in constant time. If you want to do something constant time and you say like you have infinite length, you have a contradiction there. So this is something, yeah. So BMB2 has uh, support to check some over the payload and the payload can be like any size. You can have like a 1K frame, a 1,500 byte uh, frame plus the uh, Ethernet header. You can have a jumbo frame. You can have a jumbo frame with 9K, 9.2K with 10.8K uh, size. So th this is a bit tricky. The card you see here is the one that I developed uh, the code on. It's a so-called net FPGA card. And it's basically an FPGA that happens to have some SFP plus ports. And uh, for those of you who, who uh, have programmed on an FPGA, you might remember or you, you know that like an FPGA is basically like, you know, uh, it's, it's all the gates that you can put on there. So it's very, very low level below any programming language. The nice thing here is that there is a P4 to PX intermediary compiler that compiles to HDL, which then compiles a bitstream, which you can upload into the card. The bad news is that this part of the processing pipeline is quite, um, how do I put it? Um, not fully reliable, let's put it that way. Um, so sometimes, things will fail on compiling and the usual output of the compile process is I think a couple of 10,000 lines. Now it gets a little bit worse here because uh, the compiler, the, the whole tool chain has a little bit problems because it outputs a lot of errors, which are warnings. It outputs a lot of informational messages, which are errors. And it outputs a lot of warnings, which can be either way. So this is specific to the NetFPGA and it is in a way P4 is, is a second class citizen on the NetFPGA, NetFPGA. It wasn't built for this. So there's much better gear for that. Which brings me to a small side topic. Uh, I will switch away from that. So you have seen the card. Uh, this is a card in case you want to buy it for yourself. If you're non-educational, you have to uh, put roughly seven grand there for the card itself. Uh, but you get four times 10 gig, freely programmable. So in a way, somewhat fair. Um, other gear um, is for instance, uh, just random stuff. I'm not affiliated with any of the vendors here. Uh, it's the Arista 70, 7170, which has P4 support. I haven't had my hands on it, uh, but it looks interesting. And the original thing was a barefoot switch or the, the reference platform was a barefoot Tofino. It just happens that the company barefoot was bought by Intel, I think around two years or one and a half years ago. Um, and actually they created the Tofino 2 before they were bought by Intel. And the Tofino 2 has an interesting spec here. And that is you can, and that's really interesting, do packet processing up to 12.8 terabits a second. Going back to my previous claim, P4 is operating in line speed. So in theory, I haven't tested on, on the switch, um, but in theory, when you compile the same code that I've written for the Tofino 2, 
uh, it will be able to do NAT64 at 12.8 terabits a second. Um, I think it was uh, 12.8 terabits, that is 128, 100 gig links. I don't know what the protocol was on, on those. Anyway, so you can get like the point to point is probably more in the in the size of 100 gig, but uh, the total bandwidth is 12.8 terabit. So qu quite nice stuff that we're talking about here uh, from my point of view. But again, um, so I, I used the net FPGA card uh, for my implementation and uh, yeah, it, it, it works, but it's not the easiest one. Um, in general, um, looking at uh, NAT64 design in P4, um, I tried to have the software design as nearby as a hardware design. And um, another remark here, like compiling in software takes around maybe 30 seconds maximum. Compiling for the net FPGA takes around four to six hours. Just putting this in context. So um, if you build from scratch, you make a mistake in, you know, it's, uh, your, you know, you can go to do, do the old jokes like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm compiling like the whole day. And uh, it's actually quite interesting because if you think about four to six hours compile time, so you can compile around like four times a day with one machine, roughly. What time, if you're awake for 24 hours. Well, kind of constraints there. Um, so the net FPGA doesn't, I, I said before, P4 is target independent. And that is somewhat true because um, the targets all implement the same logic that we have seen here before. They all have a parser, they all have an ingress pipeline, they all have an egress pipeline, and they all have a deep parser. But that is more or less everything that's guaranteed. Um, so the software code has real functions. The net FPGA doesn't have functions. Um, as I mentioned before, you can use defines, which are pretty much similar to uh, C style defines macros. Um, and in the end, they do the job, but it gets a bit, yeah, uh, different. In general, um, I said also P4 is operating on tables and P4 switch can operate on line speed in the tables that works, that is tested. What it can't do is populate its own tables. So to say, um, when we think about NAT64, we might, we have two different variants. One is a stateless variant where you basically map specific IPv4 range to a specific IPv6 range. This is very easy because you don't keep state. The P4 switch itself can't keep state on its own. What it can do, and that is interesting, it can, a P4 switch uh, can contact a P4 controller. And the P4 controller can be any kind of PC, can be a smartphone, can be anything, can be quite a slow computer. So what happens is you can say, there's a packet entering a P4 switch that is unclassified, that is not matching a specific table that we have in the switch. And the switch is then instructed on not matching a table entry, please forward the packet to the controller. And you would do this for stateful NAT64 uh, when you have the first packet, the initial SYN or the initial UDP packet, and you don't have a state yet in the switch. So you would forward it to the controller. The controller would say, all right, we wanted to trans uh, translate this, or the controller would say, I don't know anything about the packet and we'll just drop it. But usually the controller will create a table entry here in the switch and then say, all right, for this quadruple uh, source address, source port, destination address, destination port for the TCP and UDP uh, protocols, we make a table entry. And from that moment on the switch will handle all the translation. So that's, quite nice design. Slow, but very powerful component here on the right with a PC, maybe running Linux. Uh, in my, my case, it was running a Python code here and talking to the switch, which is high speed. Very nice mixture. I, I really have to say I, I like this design. Um, yeah, 
So that's how it works in, in, in general. When you think about NAT64 traditional before P4, what you would have is like you would have a network segment that's IPv6 only, you have a network segment that's IPv4 only, and somewhere you have a router or a NAT64 translator which brings them together, translates them, and sends them back the wire. So far, so good. With P4, things get much, much more interesting because you have a switch which is smart. So instead of moving your packets somewhere, you can, you can instruct all your layer two gear to say, well, I'm doing all the next net for uh, translations right here. If this switch here is connecting the same controller as all the other switches, it, it doesn't matter because the controllers that we have, okay, just go back, the controllers that we have seen before, they are only contacted for the first packet for the, or for the unknown packets. Sure, there's a possibility of denial of service, but you can code around this. Point being, the design here really changes when you have P4 capable equipment in your network. You can do things at the edge. You don't need to go to your core. And this, I also think that's really, really nice uh, side effect actually. All right, let's have a look a bit like the details. It, it's quite a lot of fun. I, I really, this, this part I really like. Um, so in the IPv4 world, everybody knows ARP. Uh, we know that we have an ARP cache. We can look up uh, what MAC address belongs to this IP address. And it actually turns out ARP is actually not IPv4. ARP is a separate protocol. ARP has nothing to do with IPv4. It's just accidentally there because we happen to have Ethernet. Um, but the nice thing about ARP is it's so simple. It, it is amazing. If you look at any network protocol, and I mean any, I, I don't think you get anything as nice as ARP because basically uh, one host says, who the heck has this IP address and broadcasts it? The other host, now it gets interesting, can take the same packet, change some bits and send the same data back, just basically filled in with the MAC address. Hey, my I, this IP address, I am here and sends it back. So ARP is a really, really, really nice protocol. It's, it's like very easy. If you think in a switch thinking, you want to modify the least amount of bits in your packet. So ARP is great. I really tell you like, whenever you want to tell anybody at a beer, like what is great in your life, like your, your swimming pool, your house, your, your holidays and ARP, that's certainly there. You want to mention ARP. In the IPv6 world, people were smarter and said like, oh, we have seen this in the IPv4 world. We certainly need to build in the same functionality into IPv6. So in the IPv6 world, ARP is called NDP or Neighbor Discovery Protocol. Um, it has checksums. That's great because it makes things more reliable. It's also not great because it makes things more complicated. In the IPv6 world, we don't have broadcasts. We only have multicast. And Sometimes or often this is overlapping. So often in the, uh, when we in IPv6 world, we say we are multicasting something, the effect might actually be the same because if we are asking which host has actually this IP address, it is almost the same, but not the same. So in IPv6, we can actually say, um, hey, who has 2001 DB8 2? And we will multicast it to a specific multicast group. And now that, that one is interesting because the hosts, every IPv6 capable host subscribes to different multicast groups. So you already have um, partitioned your broadcast quote traffic for discovering uh, hosts by parts of the IP address. Uh, I don't recall like which uh, bytes I uh, embedded exactly, but basically I, I think it was the last bits or bytes are embedded in the multicast address of the IPv6 address that you're looking for. So this is quite nice. So you can really, yeah, address it to different uh, systems. Right, um, now it gets funky. As said, um, ARP is nice. 
IPv6, I'm a big fan of IPv6, so don't take this the wrong way, but now comes a big but. We want to look at the MAC address. We want to know the MAC address of an IP, IP address. So we said NDP is part <clears throat> of IPv6, which is part of ICMP6, which is part of the IP, ICMP6 neighbor advertisement, which then again has an option field. And this is an optional option field with the ICMP6 link layer option. So now it gets funky because the order of the option fields is not defined in the RFCs. What is good is the ICMP6 options is a list of 64 bit blocks, but practically speaking, you need to have prior knowledge of the previous layers to see what do I expect here. So it's nothing in theory, the ICMP6 message can end after here and saying like, well, this is an ICMP6 neighbor advertisement. That's it. There's no link information in it because we are on a point to point link. Makes sense. In either, well, we always have the ICMP6 link layer option there because we have MAC addresses. But the problem is like reliably coding, um, you have a list of option fields and they can be arbitrary long. P4 doesn't do that. P4 is fixed length parsing. So if this block happens to be somewhere else, we need to have known this at the parsing time already in the beginning. So in this regard, ARP is your friend, ICMP6 works, but it's a bit more headache. All right, so let, 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 let's get, go a bit deeper into it. Let's do some translation. Uh, so let's say uh, an IPv6 host sends a packet to 2401 DB8 cafe colon and this is actually a real IPv6 address for those who don't know it, you can directly embed IPv4 addresses into IPv6 addresses. It's really cool. It works. Um, in the switch, there's a table match on this specific prefix, which is our NAT64 prefix. And because it matches, the P4 switch will call an action. And actions are um, similar to functions, but not functions. So the NAT64 uh, uh, action will then add an IPv4 header. It will do the mapping and it will eventually remove the IPv6 header. Then we do the whole deparsing and we'll send it to the right port. Uh, setting the port is also important in the P4 world because potentially you switch and you can output on a lot of different ports. So um, while this is not really related to NAT64, it, it's something that you have to do in, in the P4 world nonetheless, because you need to know where to address it to. So a simple NAT64 is one part and then remembering where to send things is a different part that you also need to have implemented in P4. So one thing that comes up very quickly is that directions matter. From an IPv6 only host, well, it's so easy to address the whole IPv4 internet. It's just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. There's 32 bits in there. They are so nothing in IPv6. If you're coming from IPv4, well, you do need to do some stateful mapping because, um, well, there's just not enough before to address just a part of IPv6. So that's interesting. It's, it's, it's a bit like, um, yeah, opposite way here. Um, so I already mentioned before the stateless mappings are usually one to one mappings and these are static mappings. Um, these are very easy. The state full mappings are the ones that we are usually interested in because we want to map a lot of IPv6 hosts, for instance, to one IPv4 address. This is the same thing that we do with CGNUT in the P4 world. So you need to have a session table, you need to have the controller. And we can here see the flow. If you have an IPv6 host, which creates an IPv6 packet, goes into the P4 switch, it will be parsed. In the first run, it sees there's a table mismatch because we don't have an entry in the session table yet. It will deparse the packet as it was, send it to the controller, which is on a special port. The controller reads the packet, will create a table entry in the switch here, 
re-inject the packet to the P4 switch as if it just came in, it will see the IPv6 packet and see, oh, there's a table match. I will translate it, I will deparse it, and then I'll put it as a IPv4 packet. That is the flow that we will always have for new sessions. So now, now comes headaches. And that is, we're changing checksums. And I mentioned before, we have them in TCP and UDP. Uh, the checksums run over the payload. In the net FPGA, we can't access the payload because the payload is variable length. And we learned variable length is something that is tricky. So I had a look into how are actually checksums built, and it's just the sum of the ones complements. So a bit of brainstorming there, and it's like, okay, in the end, we change the IPv4 protocol to IPv6 or vice versa. So all the bits in there are before used, and they are the sum of the one complements of the original header, and we have the new header, and we can actually build the difference, the delta between those two different sums, and use them to calculate the difference of the checksum. That's how you have to do it if you don't have access to checksum functions. So let's have a look at this. I, I'm using UDP because it's easy. Um, so let's say an IPv4 checksum is built over the v4 source address, the v4 destination address, uh, plus the total length in there, minus 20 for the header uh, size, plus the actual protocol. Then we say the v6 sum is the v6 source address, the v6 destination address. Those are now changed and modified. We have the payload length, which is a bit different thing because it is uh, uh, 20 more than the total length, um, plus the next header, which is the same as the protocol. So the checksum updated is the original checksum plus the v4 checksum that we have minus the v6 checksum. If anybody was able to follow, I will try to confuse you even more and give you the, exactly the code. So this is actual P4 code. So we have an action here, which says build the v6 sum over something. And here you see how nicely you can actually parse things in here. Uh, so you say, we say we have a temporary var variable, which is 16 bits. And we take, um, well, temp this is the first temp could actually have been uh, avoided, but it's more like consistency here. So we take the first uh, 16 bits of the IPv6 address and so on and so on. We just sum them up. Uh, we do the same for the destination address and like the code is the same as above. And uh, then, sorry for the mouse over there. Hope it goes away. And um, then we uh, build the complement in the end. We do the same for the for uh, sum over here. And here is the delta, uh, which also needs to deal with the uh, overflow. So we actually need 17 bits which uh, some of you uh, old people here might remember, it's the same as the uh, color depth on an Amiga. I think it was also 17 bits, uh, which was also some quirky thing. Um, so this is the actual code to do check something on a P4 switch. And there's something, the takeaway from this is P4 is protocol independent, which also means if you're dealing with protocols, you might have to implement some of the things yourself. Um, obviously, you can just use the code I've written here and, and apply it in your project. And at the moment, I can already take this uh, for, before the end. There's not so much of a uh, exchange existing yet. Like there's no like a GitHub equivalent of P4 code where you just pull in things or that doesn't exist yet to my knowledge. Right, now let's look at something more interesting at the results. And that is now for me, it's really interesting. Uh, the net FPGA independent in the end of packet size of, uh, uh, of different factors, it was more or less able, uh, able and to, to fulfill the almost 10 gigabit per second on the net FPGA card. The almost and the lower part here 
stems from uh, um, instability of the card itself. So the native PGA card is really more a development experimental board. Um, so in the end, you run at actually line speed. Now, I compared this to two other software solutions. One of them is Taiga, which is a user space Linux solution, which is, um, I believe, single threaded. Yes, it is. And there is a multi thread version out there, which I didn't test, which is somewhere CPU bound around two to three gigabit per second. But, and now it says big but, and that is we have YOL, which is a Linux kernel module. And this one performed astonishingly well. It was going up to around eight gigabit per second. And this is, for me, it's really amazing. I mean, it has to go all through the CPU and forth and back to the card, and it still performs at this uh, level. So it's, I have to say, quite, I was quite impressed. The important takeaway here is the NAT64 is running at line speed plus minus some instabilities, but those aside, um, the code here will run at 100 gig or more with minor modifications depending on the target because the targets are not as independent as I claimed originally uh, because there are some minor differences in the hardware. But generally speaking, you can use the same code, run at line speed at a different hardware. That, that is the amazing part. So that's it uh, from my side. So NAT64 runs on two different targets. Uh, as I said, YOL is really, uh, if you haven't checked it out, um, I will probably uh, just show you the link here. Uh, it's not the news website, uh, but this thing here is it, really, really nice. Uh, certainly also recommended. Uh, also runs on OpenVRT. So more the lower end of networking gear. Um, what I said, I've shown before, like there are a lot of switches out there. Uh, as I said, uh, Tofino was bought or Barefoot was bought by Intel. So the Intel stuff is the stuff that is interesting. Uh, the Arista stuff is certainly interesting. I saw that um, there is now a P4 consortium or organization. Um, so, and, and Juniper and Cisco and co are all in. So I assume that we will so see more and more equipment um, coming up. And I think the potential that is out there, it's amazing. So it's really P4. It is not the easiest programming language because you're dealing in bits uh, everywhere. You have some small nuances there, but overall it's really amazing what you can do at line speed. Yeah, that's it from my side. Um, if you have later questions, I will be answering them, obviously. If you want to follow up later, I'm usually hanging out in the IPv6 chat. You can reach me also via mail or matrix or Twitter or mobile phone or snail mail or skiing or to your liking. Uh, so yeah, that's from my side. So looking forward to hear your questions if you have any. And thank you very much, uh, Nico. And uh, like uh, clockwork, we are uh, exactly almost on the uh, exact time for uh, the questions. Uh, first of all, I really love to, to see uh, how with, 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 with open source and, and, and uh, yeah, uh, stuff you can get off the shelf uh, really can obtain that line speed uh, translation and that uh, there's still a way to communicate with, with uh, those poor people still stuck on legacy IP. <laughs> Are there uh, any questions? Uh, raise them through the mic or uh, put them in the public chat and I'll uh, relay them. Would you recommend using it in production? Yes and no. Um, so the specific code I have written certainly doesn't cover all the corner cases. Uh, and like from a security point of view, this is something certainly to have a look at, uh, especially when it comes to denial of service and especially when it can, comes to attacks. Um, besides that, I think for a proof of concept, uh, even at higher speeds, uh, it can be used. And I think anybody who is um, knowing their network uh, uh, recipes uh, knows what to look for and the code is probably quite easy to adapt. So. 
uh, let's say with a bit of work um, beforehand in the security area, I would say it's doable. Uh, Rinse Kluk uh, has a question in the public chat, and uh, the question is: uh, Are there any public uh, deployments? No, no, not to, not to my knowledge, uh, at least. Uh, and I said, like the current code uh, is uh, focused on the Net FPGA card, and uh, the Net FPGA card indeed has uh, stability issues. So, like after some hours, which is be funny because you're operating an FPGA, which is very stable and 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 static. So it should be not crashing. However, it does. Um, so uh, no public deployments, no. So just like an Amiga. <laughs> Very true. Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, does your solution also handle uh, extension headers, like, uh, like fragments? <laughs> it could, but it doesn't at the moment. Yep. Yeah. It, it, it wouldn't be hard. Like um, maybe to for some more details for this. Um, I said like the code itself is. Uh, I think there was also a question about this. Is uh, I think VHDL. Um, at the moment, this is all, the whole landscape of P4 is rather rough. And the part on my last slide here um, with the P4 OS uh, was a bit of an idea uh, that you have something like a forge where you can actually upload P4 modules, which doesn't exist as a concept yet. So in other programming languages you have, like in Python, you have your modules, in Java, you have your uh, packages, I believe, or whatever they're called. In other languages, you have libraries. This doesn't exist yet to my uh, knowledge. And this would be like a good thing to have in the future where you can say like, I have already an IPv6 stack um, where like fragmentation is handled, where uh, extension settlers are handled and all those things. And this is something that needs to be done in the P4 world. There is a, a question on the uh, public uh, chat from uh, Peter Baumann. And uh, the question is, uh, what about uh, open Ethernet? Uh, I have no clue. I don't even know what open Ethernet is, to be honest. Um, There's a link about it, also from Peter Bowman. Okay. Uh, I opened that. Open Ethernet. Okay. Looks old. Huh. Just from just guessing from the age, uh, because I see slides from 2013. This is a bit a uh, pre or around the open flow area time. Um, so I assume it will be more limited than P4, just from the age, nothing else. Uh... Yeah, I'm um, also wondering about the P4 controller. Uh, so does that also run on the uh, net FPGA or is that in the kernel or something or and it, the no, no, external? Uh, the, con the, the controller is usually on a different uh, machine. Yeah. And I actually can totally geek you out because I actually have uh, the repository <laughs> around here. Uh, so this is the source code uh, of the whole uh, thing. And uh, there's a P4 source, which is the source itself. And I have to see where I put the Python code. So I can actually show you a little bit uh, like how the code really looks like in reality. And there should the, uh, where is it? 
da, 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 da. where did I put it? It has been a while since I looked at the code. So here you see like, this, this, this typical P4 code where we do first ingress and like stuff like dropping things or uh, replying to the controller. Uh, you can see it's like it looks quite, uh, I mean, maybe make it a bit bigger. Uh, it looks quite similar to C code uh, with the exception that the actions are rather short. And the notion of an exception is really you put it into a table and the table will be able to call it. So that's that's the difference of a function. So action on its own doesn't have a purpose, but it's always um, together from a table. Yeah, and the RFCs are obviously very helpful. And um, actually here we have a table. This is how it looks like. Uh, where you match uh, on longest prefix of the IPv6 address. And then you can say there are various actions in the table. So this is really the, this is the core of the logic of P4, basically this table here. And you need to specify again, with how, how big is the table, which might also be uh, in some practical scenarios, you need to think how many hosts can I potentially address. And uh, you can actually, this one is actually quite nice here. You can actually prevent uh, your controller of being flooded by saying like, oh, if there's a table mismatch, then just don't do anything. Right, so <clears throat> so the uh, the controller is an external program or external machine. Yes. And when a uh, packet first goes out or is translated into um, IPv4, it, it makes a table entry in, in P4. It's actually programming the P4 tables. Correct, correct. Correct. Um, let me go back there to the. It's exa exactly so, like you said. Mm -hmm. So does it have a? Uh, is it? Isn't it full at some point? Is it like uh, least recently used table or? Um, well, <laughs> uh, the controller is responsible for that. So if it's full, it's full. Okay. Very, very easy. And so the, the, the idea or the notion behind this is really the controller is smart, which means that you program it yourself, uh, which means it might not be so smart in reality. No, um, the, the, the point is like you really think about it like um, the controller can be any kind of complex software. It could even be uh, connected to your ERP system where you just sold an IPv4 address and it actually con programs your switches to do the Nazis for translation. It's like uh, the interface between the controller and um, the switch is, is proprietary, but often it is solved as a, a virtual switch port or as a switch port. So basically you in the controller, you receive a raw packet and then you can handle it and you re-inject it. This is right. In a way, but nice. Yeah. That's, that's a cat, huh? So this this works best for long lasting sessions then the uh, between a source and a destination. So for the one one off, it doesn't give a, a performance improvement probably. So, so you, in most cases, you will only have the first packet of a session that you will send to the controller. Yeah. 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 That, that, that's really the idea because, as you said, like if, if you have to give push everything through the controller, you will never go line speed far from. Right. It will be very, very slow. Yeah. Uh, so, for people uh, having a bingo card, you can now check uh, there's a cat in the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I have a, a remark uh, from the public uh, chat from uh, Peter Bauman. Uh, apparently, he has been um, looking uh, a bit around uh, on the open uh, Ethernet uh, 
site and uh, he remarks that 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 uh, Mellanox now belongs to uh, Nvidia and that they do support uh, P4. So at least the open inter uh, the open Ethernet it seems to start uh, in the uh, commercial world uh, world uh, some somehow. Okay, okay. I will certainly check it out. Uh, have, haven't seen, um, but maybe conceptually could be similar. It's really old, isn't it? Published, I see slides from 2016. Uh, but again, I, I'm not familiar with the concept there. So uh, any comment is just guessing here. Stuff from 2016 is obviously really young. <laughs> yeah, the link uh, Peter Bauman uh, posted from uh, wiki uh, owners, uh, project org. It has a uh, last modified uh, February uh, 5th of uh, 2020. That is a bit more recent. Okay. Link is in the public chat. Ah, I think the approach is a bit different. Just checking the slides. I think the approach is a bit different. That there's a Linux running on the switch, which is I know about in the of the Melanox switches, which is a quite nice idea. I mean, Arista's doing the same, just different notion. Um, and that you have a Linux interacting with it. Okay, I mean, Mel Melanox switches are a quite nice concept as well, but it's a bit. Um, I would say, if it is what I think it is, it's a bit of like a parallel concept. It's not one or the other because um, P4 is really more about solving things in the network uh, backplane itself. Whereas like open Ethernet looks more like being able to provision and yeah, doesn't really look like programming to me, but yeah, again, just from taking out right right away. Okay, are there more questions or observations? I, I have some more questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm also wondering. Um, because if you're doing this on a switch, right, from uh, IPv6 hosts and uh, reaching out on the internet to uh, IPv4 hosts, that's where you need this, uh, the NET64, um, you have to go to a gateway anyway. Right, so what what is the advantage of doing this on switch ports? Uh, no, you don't. You don't. Um, let me go back. So typically, um, when you are in a data center, you already have mixed uh, environments, and you don't go through a gateway. That is the interesting part. So you can, with P4, you can have V4 and V6 hosts physical hosts connected to the same switch. The traffic never leaves the switch. It doesn't go to a gateway. Okay. The, 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 it's a yes, very good I, 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 I understand, yeah. 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 So it's within the, the network that some hosts have IPv6 only and others have IPv4 only maybe, yeah. both, yeah. Or uh, IPv4 only, yes. <laughs> It, it makes your, like, you can really th rethink your network design with that because, like, you, your assumption is, is really 100% in line with how you usually build networks. With, with P4, you can do it differently. That's, that's really the message here. So, and I'm also wondering something else. Have you also uh, experimented or uh, played with uh, BPF? And maybe the uh, Netronome SmartNICs to do similar stuff as P4. And what would be the yeah uh, the advantage uh, of one over the other or the other way around? What's your your stance on this? 
So B BPF or P4? <laughs> <laughs> well, BPF, as far as I know, is uh, Linux only. Um, so it is, uh, BPF is, it's an interesting solution for something most people won't need. Um, I'm, I'm saying this a bit mean here, um, because a lot of people think, and I, I get a lot of requests or questions regarding, can I drop IP tables or NF tables and use uh, BPF? Yes, you can. No, you won't be able to, because B BPF is a totally different beast. Um, and in, in this context, it's actually a good question because BPF is also like high performance processing. It's it's a state, uh, it's a virtual machine in the kernel, so it's it's a very interesting thing, but it's not a replacement for NF tables or IP tables. Not at least not if you're not processing in in the ten hundred gig area by default. Um, so that in in terms of P four versus BPF. Um, I think diff different target, I would say. It could be interesting because... But you, you BPF to... also has the uh, offloading to uh, network card. Right, and, and with P4, you are already by default in the network card. So mm -hmm. it's a bit different approach. Um, I haven't checked out the virtual machine itself yet. Um, I also, this is, brings me a bit to a different point, and uh, I'm always researching, looking for open switches or open routers, because we, we are doing here a lot of stuff uh, with OpenVRT, or we try to have everything open source, basically. And one of the key problems, and, and Peter will probably now point again to Mellanox, uh, it's, it's your reader, you're right here. Um, Mellanox is one of the rare things where you actually have a native Linux on. I mean, you also have it on Arista switches. Uh, you have your FreeBSD on Juniper, but it's not really accessible compared to Mellanox. And so what I'm saying is like P4, if you think about it in terms of you are Cisco, you are Juniper, you are Intel, um, you are Arista, then you have maybe something that you can agree on as a standard um, to allow people to program to program your switches, whereas BPF is maybe more focused on one of them, pra just practically seen. Not saying that mm -hmm. the technologies couldn't do either, just more seeing like from practical standpoint. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. If there are uh, no further questions, I would like uh, to uh, ask for a warm uh, applause, uh, either by uh, Emoji or by just uh, open up your microphone and uh, I thank uh, Nico for his uh, presentation this uh, evening. Yeah! yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Confused you will be.